original quote. This is from a 19th century humorist who wrote a column. Mm. And here's the full quote. The newspaper does everything for us. It does this and that. It baptizes the young, mm. marries the foolish, comforts the afflicted, afflicts the comfortable, buries the dead, and roasts them afterward. Mm. <laughs> and he said, it occurs to me this is also a job description for ministers. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much, Susan. Maybe, yeah, hold that button. There we go. How's that? Uh, I would say that I actually feel lucky to work in a profession where I can live out uh, faith in a way and work for positive change in our community every day. Um, it might sound surprising to many of you who probably may come here this morning with a not great impression of the state of media <laughs> and the state of uh, political and public discourse in the country. Um, and don't get me wrong, I could probably spend this entire hour talking about the problems in our industry. Mm. Uh, and you know, particularly the blurring of the lines between, um, between uh, opinion and entertainment and commentary and news. And I think that's done a real disservice mm. to uh, what all of us up here do, mm. and that there's a very deliberative and disciplined approach to our news reporting and mm. gathering. And, um, you know, those of us in daily journalism, those of us with bylines, our names, our faces on news reports, uh, go about this in a certain way. Um, there's a, you know, there's a, there's a large sign on the a wall of the Washington Post when you enter with the seven principles of newspapering mm. as uh, discerned by Eugene Meyer, uh, mm. Kevin Graham's uh, father back in the 1930s. And mm. the first of those is that the newspaper's job is to, to tell the entire, the truth as much as the truth can be ascertained. Mm. And the second is to tell all the truth. And the third and fourth are to tell it whether it uh, helps, the benefits the owner of the newspaper or not, whether, you know, certainly not in a way that it would benefit special interests. Mm. Um, so, you know, that feels pretty good, right, to go to work in, in a building every morning where, mm. you know, you're in the best telling, the best way that you carry out your job, you're a truth seeker and a truth teller. Mm. And, you know, I do think about it in those, in those terms. Um, you know, we're really dealing with absolutes where, uh, you know, math and formulas and things, we're dealing with trying to ascertain people's motivations for what they're doing. And, and their actions and, and write about those in real time and it's it's a messy business mm. uh, but it is a sincere one mm. and I do think you know sometimes we work long nights and weekends and there's I'm sure we all have stories of times we've missed with family but it's because mm. we do take this job very seriously mm. uh, we do work sometimes having very long debates about a single word in a story mm. and all in the vein of trying to get it right and mm. I will just kind of leave it there, I guess, for now to say that it is a sincere effort, and, mm. and I think we can all uh, appreciate that, uh, you know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of problems in this industry, but there's also a lot of good that you can try to take good every day. Mm. Um, it's funny that you mentioned uh, arguing over a word. It wasn't that long ago where me and a few editors got into this very spirited conversation <laughs> over the word <laughs> mystery. Mm. We, we couldn't this editor said we couldn't use the word mystery in the story about this you know, shadowy company we're talking about because the two people who made it know who it is and it's not a mystery to them. And I'm like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> and so like, so the, the arguments, I mean, we are, I mean, Aaron is right, we are very deliberate, you know, mm -hmm. I, and, I, and I think the problems in the industry are probably not what you would think. I think mm -hmm. sometimes it comes down to, frankly, who, you know, our mm -hmm. structures and are we publicly traded and you know, these stockholders, you know, you know, maybe their interests are above what the public's is in mm. terms of news. Going back to faith, I mean, I kind of look at this a little differently. I went to a Jesuit university mm. um, in California, um, the one that's, you know, down from Stanford, if you've heard of that one, from Santa Clara. <laughs> um, and I always felt like more Jesuit universities should have more robust journalism programs mm. because it seems very part and parcel to not just j a Jesuit education, but mm. a Christian, the idea of, finding truth, using, you know, mm. using your vocation compassionately. And when it comes to my daily life, I mean, I'm, I was working on a story not too long ago where this is suffice to say, you know, it's, it's taken me a lot longer to get it out than I probably would like. And that's because we have to be careful mm. because
because it might out the person who, who did it, and protecting sources is a very important mm -hmm. thing. I mean, without that, I mean, if people don't trust you, that, that's it. I mean, these are people who could lose their jobs, their livelihood if it's classified information, they could go mm -hmm. to jail on top of it, mm -hmm. um, and they're risking a lot for you. And, you know, I could, you know, burn a source, as we, we would say, and just mm -hmm. run it anyways, but I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna do that. I don't think, that, I don't think many people would. Mm -hmm. And these are the types of things I think about as I, you know, it's very cliche, but I do have to look myself in the mirror, at myself in the mirror. I have to look at my, you know, my daughters with a straight face, my mm -hmm. wife, I, the people I love. I can't do awful, evil things. I can even remotely get to that point. It's just not who I am. Mm -hmm. and, and Susan is right. These values of, of, of my faith are very much entwined with journalism, with journalistic ethics, with how it's practiced in modern day America, um, or at least, you know, the, the 20th, 21st centuries. Mm. And I love that quote, by the way. I didn't realize that was a longer, part of a longer thing, mm. and I, I like other parts of it better. So that's kind of <laughs> um, the roasting after death. But that's kind of where I mm. where I think about it. Thank you. Very similar. I I'm, I'm feel like my work is an extension of my faith, and that I, um, my faith calls on me to be loving and tolerant are all things that, well, I don't have to love every subject that I interview, but I do try to be fair, and I do mm. try to be tolerant, and I do try to understand, and I <coughs> do hope that the people I'm communicating with pick mm. up on that as well. Um, going back to this discussion about choosing a single word, uh, I, I got an angry email a couple of days ago from a viewer, so mm. I report back my stories are in Awning, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, Tulsa every day. Um, somebody thought that my use of the word ultra in describing a group of conservatives um, at the Capitol right now was um, carried a negative connotation. And I, you know, this is something we struggle with. You mm. know, I, I didn't just choose that word out of thin air. I thought long and hard about mm. it. And, but in the end, I, you know, and I wrote a long explanation to the person explaining that that was not the intention. And, and just out of fairness, the next day I happened to be back interviewing the guy that I actually had in mind when I was talking about that and just told, uh, told him about this and they, they were like, oh, that's a badge of honor. You know, so <laughs> they were not upset <laughs> by it at all and I thought, okay, that validates the, you know, the concern that I mm -hmm. had and, and, you know, again, I, we're, we're always, we're trying to do the best job we can and, mm -hmm. um, and that's, how I, that's how I approach my job. Take very seriously for the most of my most of my career. I didn't cover politics. I covered just local news, hmm. um, and so it was that sort of approach with whatever the story was hmm. that I try to employ. And again, it, it really is an extension of my faith. Hmm. There's a, a kind of double meaning in our title for today. I mean, partly we have people of faith who are working in the media, but also there's these big questions right now about kind of faith in institutions of all kinds, including the media. Um, I know I see this at Princeton Seminary. Um, we have younger generations especially who are um, suspicious sometimes of, of existing institutions, the way they work, the way that the world works. Um, and I wonder how, you know, I, again, I think it's, it affects political parties, it affects universities, it affects all kinds of, I wonder how that kind of faltering faith in institutions of all kinds affects the work that you do and affects the organizations that you work for. How do you see that coming up? And we can go down the line again, or if you want to kind of jump in as you would like, we can, we can do it however you want. Well, I, I, I'm happy to jump in right away yeah. because yeah. It, in my case, <coughs> it, it's had a real silver lining. Yeah. So obviously it, it can be very difficult. Um, uh, you know, Aaron mentioned the blurring of the lines, yeah. uh, and that's a real problem yeah. uh, for all of us. It makes us all have to work harder um, to gain the trust of, of the people we're trying to serve. Mm. Um, so this notion that you know there's it, you know there's fake news out there and, and it's it's not real um, in a way benefited me because. My, the owners of my media company, a very small media company that owns just a couple of TV stations, mm. decided back in 2019, you know, maybe some of our viewers don't really trust the national mm. media. Mm -hmm. And so they said, well, let's send one of our own people to DC. Mm. And that's when they asked me to come out here to mm. you know, help the guy 
Mm -hmm. I've been on TV there for 25 years. Mm -hmm. They know him, they trust him. Um, so it worked to my benefit in a mm -hmm. sense that I got mm -hmm. to come out here and, and mm -hmm. do what I really want to do. But but it is, um, you know, that's it's a real problem because I obviously, I, as I mentioned in the email, I still run into it all the time. Mm -hmm. People who just don't trust you. You have to work harder, mm -hmm. um, I think. think and um, that, that's what it's done. I think it's made us all have to be more diligent mm. to make sure that mm -hmm. um, we're really crossing our T's and dotting our I's. Mm -hmm. You know, that's so interesting because one of the as one part of the mm. news media that's fared pretty well in trust is local TV news. Mm. Yeah. Uh, trust in local TV news is higher than it is for mm -hmm. national news, national mm -hmm. networks. Uh, and I think that's because your local TV tends to be very grounded mm. in the community they serve. But can I ask you a question? This mm. is just, I'm going to ask it anyway. So. <laughs> 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 so In the sense that um, I, I will still do the national stories, but you know I'll include the members of our delegation mm. in those stories. But so I mean, that are you proving the fake news thing? Are you sure no. saying uh, yes? You can't trust these other outlets. Oh no! Mm. Are there no, because I think that I'm I'm essentially telling the same story. Mm. There, but but they are hearing their members um, mm -hmm. in those stories. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I'm not telling them that. Necessarily telling a different is it that they trust you, that you're a known person for them, and I, so I it's think that's yeah. Part of it. yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I was, uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I was an anchor there for a mm -hmm. long time, mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. I guess um, mm -hmm. I'm a trusted person in that mm -hmm. community. So mm -hmm. they know, mm -hmm. and, and, and you know, I should say that's probably not the only reason they did it. I think mm -hmm. they, they saw an opportunity to gain an advantage over you know, other others in the market, but but I think that was a, a, a driving force in their decision to set it up. I mean, I'm going to be honest. I have a real problem with the phrase fake news, and I, I and I do because I let's be honest. I think there's a difference between having you know having a, an, an intellectual and on, intellectually honest criticism with something that a story does, either in terms of how it's framed or a, a fact that gets wrong. And by the way, that's one of the worst things, at least for me. And I know I can speak for probably all of us mm. up here. Is getting something wrong is like. Mm. One of the worst things you getting scooped is like not great, but like <laughs> getting something wrong. And what, why scoops matter? Mm. By the way, it's because if you keep missing news, people are not going to pay for it. Like, why would you keep going to the thing that is mm. always late to a story? Like, you know, mm -hmm. um, fake news bothers me because let's be honest, it, it was made and used by politicians as a preemptive prophylactic to not to like you know basically you know stem whatever critical news is about to come out at them. Mm. It's it's a very just another sort of you know, pithy way to, to kill the messenger, mm. right, or to shoot the messenger. And I just feel like we should separate those those two things. Um, you know, that being said, for whatever reason, a lot of people do believe that. But going to local news, we were talking about this, I think, mm -hmm. right before, mm -hmm. is that I think, well, not I think, most of the journalism in this country is not national political news covering campaigns. Like, mm -hmm. most of the journalism in this country is at the local level with, with people who barely have two nickels to rub together because newsrooms across the country are decimated. Thank you, the internet and print advertising mm -hmm. and also newspaper companies that for decades, and mm -hmm. I've seen it, refuse to get with the program and change. Mm -hmm. You know, when you, because mm -hmm. when you have 20% profit margins, why bother changing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and just in the last year alone, I mean, the local news that have, have been very impactful, like um, one small town in the south where there was a police department that would mm -hmm. prey on drivers, very poor ones in order mm -hmm. to inflate the coffers of like the, the city that didn't mm. have a lot of money. That guy ended up getting fired. There were new laws. I think somebody was prosecuted. Mm. Um, a buddy of mine in Milwaukee at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, he and a team worked on a series of stories showing how these electrical fires kept happening in homes across the city because the city wasn't doing its job in proper inspections. They did mm. it and they probably saved lives. Mm -hmm. And I think my worry is, is fine, maybe we don't like everything that's certain about Joe Biden or Donald Trump. But when that sort of, in some ways, I think unfounded cynicism gets attached to the media, mm. whatever that is, I think then when a local paper comes along or a local outlet that does something really important that has nothing to, to do with the White House, like the low tide sinks all boats. Mm. And to me, like that's, that's a real problem for democracy.
process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I amplify that one way? Mm -hmm. Just to, there's two sides to this uh, faith and institutions question. Okay. One, it affects how we cover these institutions, mm -hmm. and you know, we obviously are dialing up the magnifying glass mm -hmm. and scrutiny of places where, I mean, you know, there's good reason that people have lost faith in Congress to make tough decisions, and you know, courts to do more than reflect our partisan positions on things. Um, but when it comes to lost faith in the media writ large, uh, the problem is, is that uh, people are just dialing out, turning it off, not listening, and uh, people are re retreating to <coughs> the, the places where they think they're going to hear the news that they want to hear, mm -hmm. or the version of things that they want to mm -hmm. hear. Um, what that means in a practical effect is that almost half the country mm. will not read what I write. Mm -hmm. um, and, and if they hear that, it, if mm. they heard it somehow and then heard where it came from, they wouldn't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, that's a, you know, for me, that's a real problem. It's a real problem when I go out and try to interview people across the country. Mm -hmm. It used to be that you might get an earful from somebody privately, but, you know, they'd keep talking mm. to you. Now I get, like, a very public, loud dressing down. I'm not mm. going to talk to the propagandist Washington Post, mm. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, uh, you know, it's concerning. Um, I do think that it helps explain also, you know, there's going to be lots of efforts to cross that divide that are going to be ugly. Um, mm. You know, this latest brouhaha at NBC where they hire Rona McDaniel mm -hmm. to try to mm -hmm. bring in more, uh, you know, of another, the other side of the audience that is, that is tuned out. Mm. Um, there, there's going to be a lot of those kind of efforts. But how do we try mm. to get the other half of the country to listen to us mm. again? Well, let me jump in on this because, I mean, one of the things, and Jack, you, you're talking about local news, local media. I mean, one of the aspects of the kind of contemporary landscape has been the hollowing out of local media and that these organizations have really been struggling and, and financially struggling and and um, bought up and 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 whatnot and I guess I wonder I mean it does seem to me like the the faltering faith in institutions which these institutions long brought us together in various ways you think about you know uh, the nightly news or churches like this one, right? P places where people could come together across lines of difference. Um, as these institutions falter, we also are seeing um, heightened polarization. So I wonder, you know, in this time where, yeah, there's, there's talk of fake news and social media silos and, and local news is really struggling. I mean, are, 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 do you see ways that we can cultivate trust across divides in this moment with its many challenges? Well, we're all trying to figure that out because yeah. the erosion of uh, trust in the news media is catastrophic. Mm -hmm. It's catastrophic for the news media. Uh, if you don't believe what we, we write and say, it's catastrophic for the democracy. Mm. It is hard to imagine you can have a successful democracy mm. without a trusted press. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are. We have. Um, it took us a long time to. It took a long time for the erosion of trust in mm -hmm. our particular institution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's going to take a long time to build it back. But there are very particular things we are trying to do. We're trying to be more transparent. Mm. Um, we are more likely to describe who we talk to for a story, mm. how we went about talking to them mm. for a story, who we are. So now you see often little bios mm. at the bottom of a story or something you can click on so you mm. can see who is the reporter who wrote this story and is mm. it someone I can... I can trust you. So we try to be more transparent. We try to be more mm. grounded in the people who we cover, whether we're a local news uh, outlet or, or a mm. national one. Mm. Uh, because I think w I think one of the things that we criticized ourselves for after the 2016 presidential mm. election is that we were not listening hard enough mm. to everybody, mm. or else we would have had a better understanding beforehand mm. of the forces behind Donald Trump's uh, election. Uh, and there are, uh, and we're trying to do this all at a time when our financial our business model mm. has collapsed all around mm. us. Mm. So now you see news media doing all kinds of different things, not one silver bullet, uh, but doing nonprofits, doing mm. local uh, local outlets, trying to use social media in a, in a smarter way. Mm. These are all things we're trying to do to regain the trust that's been lost. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, look, journalism is expensive. I mean, it, you know, mm. you have to pay, I mean, anybody who works or runs a business I mean, human capital is an, ex is, is an expensive expense, right? To some degree, so is brick and mortar, that's less of an issue. Running a printing mm -hmm. press is extremely expensive. <coughs> that's
that's <coughs> offset now because you know fewer people are reading the print product, but that also was a cash cow, so you kind of have to balance mm -hmm. it as well. Mm -hmm. um, we have to pay for lawyers. I mean, what we do, mm -hmm. I mean, people want, especially if they don't trust us, mm -hmm. there's many more threats of a lawsuit. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to have lawyers, you know, s sensitive stories who vet things. Talk about going over every single word mm -hmm. of a story. Mm -hmm. um, and lawsuits, especially law lawyers in this room know, it can be very, very, very expensive. Even mm -hmm. just having a lawyer on retainer and having them work a few hours is not cheap. Mm -hmm. And local news doesn't have that anymore. I mm. mean, I started my career at the Arizona Daily Star in Tucson. And when mm. I was there mm. in the mid-aughts, that was, I think we had 100 people in the newsroom. Mm. Now I think we're down to like seven. Well, and that's Tucson, Arizona, well. which is a, s a size of a city roughly the size of the district. Mm. So that's not great. Yeah. That's not great at all. Because when I was there, we had our work cut out for us in terms of dealing with you know, potential corruption and chicanery in the city government, in the Pima County government, the state, what big business was doing. And like we could barely keep it together then and get the right story mm -hmm. because we just had so many pressures on ourselves. Um, I think going back to trust, I think newspapers and news industry, the news industry for a long time has done a bad job of explaining how it is we do journalism. Mm. I don't know if it's because, you know, I mean, this shows like Law and Order, like who doesn't like Law and Order? <laughs> Law and Order or TV shows, which might not get like the details right, but generally you, you mm. kind of know how cops work, how the courts work, how doctors in an emergency mm. room work, kind of. Mm -hmm. There's not really a lot for journalism unless it's like Aaron Sorkin, you know, on, mm -hmm. on the newsroom years mm -hmm. ago with HBO. And I, I agree with Susan, like the more that we try to be transparent of like who we are, but also why it is that we do things, I think mm. we need to do more better. Like why we use, for instance, anonymous quotes. It's not because we're lying about it. If mm. I ever got caught doing that, I mean, I'd be finished and like tarred and feathered and shoved out of the building, mm. are you kidding? We have to do it almost ironically more so because people don't trust us and want to be on the record mm. because then they're gonna get, you know, they're, they're, they have their own issues, mm. which might very well might be financial, might be job, might be legal. Mm -hmm. And we have to be very careful with that stuff, but people, there's a sizable amount of folks who think that when we use an anonymous source that we're just making it up somehow. And it's like, no, 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 that's a very, Mm. Th th there's a lot of steps we go before we do that, and mm -hmm. the amount of time I've had to convince people to go on the record is is exhausting. Mm. But sometimes we have to do that, and it just we may not agree with it, but we being the public, mm. but we should do a better job, I think, of explaining like when you read a news story, like what go what what goes into the making of that sausage, mm -hmm. you know? And, mm -hmm. and I think we're trying to do a little better with that. Yeah, yeah. So it just you asked kind of what people can do in this yeah. in this age. I do think that um, one thing we can all do is read more. Um, I'm guilty of this, this news fatigue of feeling like I see a headline and I know the story and I know, mm. you know, the, you know, the, the largely the, the arguments mm. of X, Y, or Z issue. Uh, there's a reason mm. these is these stories are back in the newspaper. There's a reason mm. that news organizations are going back to some things that happened in the previous administration at this moment and, and looking back at those in a different way. And there's more to learn. There's mm. more that's changing in, in some of the understanding of things. And it's worth reading. It's worth understanding what ha why mm. you know, the reporters put something in paragraph 26 or 30. Mm. And, and those points are important to then carry out and have conversations with people about it. Mm. The news, um, don't just retreat to your mm. corners in this point in time. Mm. I, it doesn't help the industry, but I feel like one of the ways that I see the most uh, positive change for the perception of reporting and the news business is on the one-on-one -on -one interactions that I have with sources, with people mm -hmm. that I've never met before. And when they realize the care that goes into an interview or understanding their perspective of going back to them mm -hmm. and fact-checking and making sure I've contextualized what they said in the right way mm -hmm. and then checking in with them after the story, they have a much better opinion of the news business mm. after that happens, but that's one person <laughs> at yeah. a time, and it's yeah. going to be a long time to change mm. things that way, but mm. anyway, the one-on-one -on -one conversations we can all have are all important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, th as much as you can engage people one-on-one, -on -one, um, I do it, and I think it, it does help, but mm. as Susan mentioned, this, you know, didn't happen overnight, we're not going to repair the trust overnight, it's a, uh, and the mm. forces working, you know, against that are mm -hmm. strong, mm -hmm. and so... I'm not super optimistic about it, but I think mm. that all these things that uh, my colleagues have <coughs> mentioned here are things that I know we're doing. We're trying to be more transparent, mm. uh, using social media, which is certainly a double-edged sword, but mm. trying to use it in a positive way. Mm -hmm. 
um, to give people a little more yeah. behind the scenes look at how we do our jobs yeah. um, so that it's not some mysterious thing where they just think that we're you know mm -hmm. making something up um, so th those are the sorts of things and yeah. it's just a little thing that you you know in, in my daily approach to the job it's yeah. Again, um, being as open as I can with people, mm. um, trying to uh, respond to criticism mm -hmm. when they come along mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. not just ignore them because that's pretty mm -hmm. easy to do, yeah. um, but to engage with people um, who have a concern mm. and, um, and just keep the fight in the fight. Mm. It's an election year, and I... I wonder, I mean, it strikes me that over the last decade, there's been a lot of talk about um, does American democracy have a future? And, and certainly the media has taken this up. It's been, you know, the talk at the ground, I think. And I just think about the framing. And I think about, you know, as we move through this election year with, you know, there's a lot of anxiety about this election, a lot of anxiety about the meaning of the election. Um, I think amid the, the kind of turmoil of the last decade, there's certainly been folks I see in my social media feeds pressing the media to change its role in our public life and to, to become more aggressive in, in pushing kinds of questions or in reframing stories to, to really meet the moment, the urgency of the moment. And I wonder how you think about this, like the kind of framing of our moment, the framing of this year. Uh, you know, how do you talk about the framing piece? Is this a crisis for democracy that, you know, this is the latest, you know, moment in it? Do you worry about that kind of framing as generating lots of anxiety but not necessarily moving us forward as a, as a society? How do you think about those kind of framing questions? Well, I, I do think we face a moment of crisis in our democracy, and yeah. not the only one. It's not mm -hmm. that we've never faced that before as a nation, but I think we face it now. Mm. Uh, there was an effort to overturn the last election, mm -hmm. which by every investigation by multiple states and agencies was free and fair mm -hmm. and legitimately mm -hmm. uh, uh, determined. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are a lot of Americans who don't believe that. Mm -hmm. And the election was not overturned because of the institutions that are mm -hmm. in such fire held up. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it is not overstating, it's not hyperbole mm -hmm. to say the stakes of this election are enormously high. And so we do face pressure from some uh, I think more on the left than the right, mm -hmm. that our role should then be more of mm -hmm. an advocacy role that's uh, mm -hmm. uh, at this moment of crisis, and I completely disagree with that. Mm -hmm. I think our role is to do what we are supposed to do, mm -hmm. which is observe and report, uh, to provide context and history, mm -hmm. to tell Americans what's going on mm -hmm. and to let them decide. It mm -hmm. is not for us to decide. Mm -hmm. uh, our role of the mainstream media is to do our job and do it better, mm -hmm. not to do some of the advocacy mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. some would have us provide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, are, are we in a crisis? I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm pretty pro-America. I think we'll get through this. I think we'll, I mean, I'm pretty, I mean, we've mm. seen awful things before. Mm. To me, at least as my job, it's in some ways irrelevant. I mm. think, um, you know, at the end of the day, I don't look at, I mean, should we be tough? We, of course we should be tough. We mm -hmm. should be tough in terms of rigorously asking questions. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are two men who want to have arguably the most powerful job in the world. One mm -hmm. who, like, we want to hire him again. Mm -hmm. Well, both of them, do we want to hire them again, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you got to take the heat, you know, you got to take the heat or get out of the kitchen. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. there's there needs to be very tough questioning. And not just the presidency. I mean, you know, Muriel Bowser and, mm -hmm. you know, the mayor of Washington. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mm -hmm. You have a very privileged and important role. And in fact, I would say is that the presidency, these are the two people who, if they're in that job, have the nuclear launch code. Mm -hmm. Like, let's not forget that. Mm -hmm. These are like the mm -hmm. question, I mean, like, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, like you get a few, a couple mm -hmm. of critical questions. That's our mm -hmm. job. Mm -hmm. And I think being able mm -hmm. to, you know, be dispassionate about it, you know, not to, I mean, our, our old boss at the Post, Marty Barron, uh, Aaron, Aaron, unfortunately, had to sit next to me for about <laughs> half of the Post. Um, Marty Barron would, you know, at the start of the Trump presidency, I think faced similar types of questions mm. and said, you know, we're not at war, we're at work. Mm. Like our job is to ask questions. It might not look great, you know, especially if you if you really have a favored candidate, those questions can look like 
you know, you're somehow biased or something. Mm -hmm. I, that's not how I approach it. I approach mm -hmm. it that we ask tough questions of everyone. Should we be asking tougher ones? Sure, like the one-on-one -on -one thing. Mm -hmm. Then send me a note and say that. Don't send me the emails that I constantly get after writing these stories, which are, I won't repeat them, but they're mm -hmm. awful. Mm -hmm. Like they don't think that we're human beings sometimes. Mm -hmm. And it's like once they call and have that one-on-one, -on -one, they're like, oh yeah, you're a, a, a a person like me with children. And mm. it's like, yeah, mm. yeah, it's a job. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not just like a political operative or something or you know, mm. some nameless face that you read in the paper. Mm. So I think we just do what we've been doing and we're transparent about it. We're uh, you know, professionally as aggressive as we need to be. Mm. The election happens and we move on. We cover the next story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I was the question is, you know, are we at an inflection point yeah. uh, in our democracy? I mean, I'm not, I wouldn't be telling the truth if I didn't admit that I'm a little concerned about the direction of things. But at the same time, I see examples every day mm. that reassure me that um, <laughs> that we can withstand whatever whatever mm. comes along. Mm. Um, not that there may be some uh, real difficulties, but um, I'm still one that believes that the that you know the forces for democracy are much stronger than those who would mm. take us in a different direction. And um, I, I, you know, I also think about if, if we're in this world here in D.C. where so much is political, and mm. yet so much of the country um, isn't even aware of what's going on here. I mm. mean, I, you know, a, a lot of my friends back in mm. Oklahoma, um, I'll tell them about something I'm covering, and they just don't have mm. the slightest clue. So mm. it's not that they are not all potentially impacted by, what, by what's going on here; they mm. are, but. I just feel like sometimes things do get um, mm. blown up a little bit more. Um, mm. And I, I feel like we've got a lot of, you know, we, we there are actually a lot of really good people mm. um, out there who are trying to work for good. And so that's, mm -hmm. that's what I'm, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I maybe I'm a little naive and a little too optimistic, but that's what I'm feeling about mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. things are headed. Even if, even Regardless of what happens in the selection, yeah, yeah, I'll pick up on that and give you my doomsday. <laughs> <laughs> that there's two sides of that coin, right? Mm. Everybody's, I think, yeah. Everybody generally, I think, if you actually put everybody in a room and you know mm. decide what does it mean to be American, where do we all really fit on the mm. spectrum of a lot of issues? We're close together, but mm. the problem is, is that I do think that we are in a way because of mm. a couple of the layers of things we've talked about so far, mm. in danger of losing the center of gravity mm. in our democracy. And that is because largely the erosion of this press, right? <coughs> in the last 20 years, we've lost 3,000 daily newspapers in the country. Mm. And you know, when you're living in a community across the country, mm. you know, there are lots of issues locally that cross political divides. A new road, a school problem, a, you know, a local tragedy. These are things that define local <coughs> narratives of who people are, who communities are. Mm. Um, and when those are lost, you lose the ability to talk about things, you know, down the street with your neighbor. Mm. It's so much easier to go home, turn on cable news, and revert to mm. the national talking points, the mm. you know, the sound bites on issues, and that's splits us further apart and gives us less room and, you know, less common ground to talk about mm -hmm. things. Um, you know, there's, I've, I've worked a lot on January 6th and I've mm -hmm. been working uh, a lot in the last year on a lot of reporting about the justice system. Mm -hmm. I do talk to a lot of people in that world and a lot of anonymous sources and attorneys mm -hmm. and prosecutors and judges who also are very concerned about this point in time. Mm -hmm. And I do too. But it really is more in the sense of the lack of, of a public and common narrative that we have. You know, mm. there's now a third of, nearly a third of Republicans who support the rioters who entered mm. the Capitol, um, who say that they did the right thing that day. And polls, Gallup polls, they track this, these questions over time. There's more than a third on the right who, and I grew up a Republican, who, uh, you know, who um, believe that Biden didn't really actually win the election, that he's an illegitimate president. So when you look back at Watergate and what happened in Watergate, the country largely agrees mm. about what happened in that time period, right? Mm. We're at a point now, or an inflection point, where I feel like we're very close to a point where people don't agree on the basic set of facts of what just happened. Mm. 
And when that happens, and when people are able to distort that and use that and create an alternate narrative to mm. demonize and set people against the other half, mm. it is a really dangerous point. Mm. And that's before we get to like artificial intelligence. Mm. So mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I mean I, I, it strikes me that you all spend a lot of your time um, doing this important investigative work, uh, tracking down leads and stories, and and bringing things to light that that sometimes are hard truths, sometimes are are uh, worrisome, anxiety producing in their own right. And I wonder, kind of circling back to that first question in a way, you know, as people of faith who are reporting on this stuff, who are experiencing, as many of us are, kind of anxiety about this moment. How do you find, I mean, are there, are there things that you can recommend, things that you, things that you find uh, that you would commend to people on the ground, you know, people in this church, people in churches across the country who are reading these headlines, having lots of, of anxiety, and wondering, what, how do people bear up under this anxiety and contribute to a better church and world in this moment? I mean, and I guess I wonder if you have you know, either thoughts from your own lives on what you're doing, practices that you've taken up, or, or things that you've seen in your reporting of people who are finding ways under great pressure to, to do the right thing. <laughs> Jen helps. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, I do think that there, I am still surprised with all mm. the cynicism, with all, you know, with everything that we just talked about that there are still people willing to mm. come forward and when they feel like things have gone wrong to, to, to take the risk and talk to us. Mm. That, you know, at the end of the day, that when we do things, there are still, you know, politicians on the Hill. I mean, oh, there's a lot of people work on the Hill who, I mean, most of them, all of them, or mm. anywhere, who like wanna do a good job. Like mm. they're in government, they're in public service because they, you know, they're not there because they want a name for themselves necessarily. Mm -hmm. They want to do the right thing, and a lot of people do want to do the right thing. Mm. And I think we need, you know, as people who know me are like, that's way too optimistic for you to say. Mm. Um, but but I, I do, and I, I think, you know, just one, uh, just as a side point, I should say, um, you know, Aaron talks about the thousands of papers that have, have left. Um, I know this is a bit of a self-serving realization, but um, a professor I know is, is working on a, a study, like an actual, like, mm. correlative study about the decline of newspapers, and there is a direct correlation right, to an inverse you know, relationship mm. that as these newspapers go down, and you mm. know, so you have these news deserts, corruption goes up. Mm. I mean, it makes, it, I mean, it logically makes sense, mm -hmm. but this is the first time that they're actually proving that mm. that's true, and Aaron's right, we don't have a common hymnal to sing from. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're all only caring about what Joe Biden is doing in a particular day, and yet there's like a freeway getting mm. bulldozed down the street, and we don't talk about that, well, I mean, mm -hmm. there's a lot of problems with mm -hmm. that, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, um, I both believe that the apocalypse, apocalypse is coming, and also that it's a great time in America. Mm. <laughs> 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 I like I like the apocalypse coming, but it was also a great time. 
<laughs> so there's little things, right? We can not feed the bad pigs. We can not, you know, perpetuate some of the things that that are out there. Um, I would say, you know, all of us go out every day trying to write stories, to illuminate things, to bring things to life. Whatever it is, however you want to be active, I would urge you guys to be active. Like be active citizens. Um, don't wake up on November 6th, whatever your political bent is, and feel like, how did this happen? Mm. You know, um, go out and talk to people, have mm. conversations about it, be active in your community. Um, there is also just in, in my world something that I'm starting to uh, volunteer a little bit with, which is called the News Literacy Project, which is hoping that this time period is like the nadir and, and mm. that things will get better and that, you know, mm. in the next generation, my kids will be able to discern and learn and read the news and understand what's news and what's commentary and what's fake and why, you know, just be very mm. critical and careful readers of the news. And we're not, we've been, we have in this generation done a terrible job letting everybody lump everything together, mm. that every commentary, every everything is the media. You mm. know, we can't trust the media. And if mm. we can really break <coughs> that down into what is trustworthy and what's just somebody's mm. comments, those are very different things. Mm. And we should just be more careful about that. Mm. The only thing I would add is just that, um, as Jack mentioned, that th know that there are people out there who really are trying to do good. Um, I know that within the delegation that I cover, mm. um, there are some people there who are really, you know, th they will go along with, you know, they'll say what they have to say politically mm. to, you know, not not get primary, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. not get roasted at home, but mm. they're doing good work and they believe mm -hmm. in working across the aisle. They, you know, Oklahoma's a, a very red state. The delegation's all Republican. Um, but there are some really um, civil good leaders. Mm. Um, this guy, Tom Cole, who just become the chairman of appropriations is a good example of that. Mm. Uh, Frank Lucas, who's uh, chairs the Science Space Technology Committee. Um, another good example of that, you know, really people who believe in public service and, you know, occasionally will frustrate me by saying things that I know they probably don't really believe, but mm. because they, they want to get reelected. But in being reelected, they're there doing good work. Um, they're doing what they think is good for the country. And so I'd say that there are more people like that than, you know, who are working for us than many people realize. And so that, that does keep me sustained at times hear about some of the other folks who are out there all over social media or trying to grab headlines or filing motions to vacate and that sort of stuff. Mm. So there are some you know, thoughtful leaders out there in our midst. This isn't one that I had, had given you in advance, but I, I, I am thinking about this and I, I, as you're talking about kind of the way we're moving, and one of the things that's it's been lots in the conversation of late is AI. And I wonder, you know, you all are, are persons of integrity who are, are doing this work and, and attentive to all these questions. And I wonder, as you, as you think about a world in which AI comes to play a greater role, I imagine, also in your world as it is in mine, how that also may come into play as we, as we think about these kinds of issues. Is that something you all are already talking about and thinking about in your organizations? Well, we've been trying to figure out how to use it as a resource that doesn't undermine what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, be, we had done, we, the Gannett Company, of which I'm not in charge, uh, <laughs> have uh, tried uh, using some AI on like uh, high school sports coverage and things. And it was mm. a mixed, it, it worked, but some, it repeated lies and mm. made mistakes and it sounded ridiculous, like someone who didn't speak English would bring these stories until we put it down. But I think this is going to be a huge force mm. in journalism and everything else we do. Mm. And we're just in the, of trying to figure out how to make it work well. Hmm. I, we actually just had a discussion, a whole um, town hall or whatever, as we call it, at the, at the journal last week about this. Hmm. Um, you know, in fact, one editor put up kind of like a chart of like what it's most likely good at and where, where it's still a long ways off mm -hmm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Replacing journalism, it's even is way up there because, hmm. I mean, 
an algorithm can't really sit in a bar for two hours and convince somebody to like tell you a secret that they're going to go to jail for. Mm. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, if they could, maybe that'd make my job easier. But you know, just for, by way of disclosure, I mean, I, I'm a, a what's called a data journalist, which mm. means that I both a journalist and a programmer, and I try mm. to use one to make my job easier for the mm. other. And you know, and, and we, have, we have guidelines. We have guidelines of how mm. we can use things. I mean, mm -hmm. for no other reason, you know, what journalism, mm. what journalists do is proprietary. I mm -hmm. mean, it, you know, in terms of company proprietary information, mm -hmm. you know, you don't want to put stuff in because mm -hmm. then it's part of like, then you kind of release that to somebody mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. We have our own models we use, but at any rate, mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it is helpful to be like, oh, here's a, a section of code that I'm banging my head against the wall and I can't figure out why it's not working. Well, I mm -hmm. copy and paste in and be like, what's wrong with this? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, you forgot a, mm -hmm. a something here. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, okay. That just saved me two hours of mm -hmm. frustration, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, Bloomberg, when I, I used to work for Bloomberg mm -hmm. News, has a whole thing, and they make it very clear, by the way, in like a yellow mm -hmm. backgrounded byline, like mm -hmm. by Bloomberg Automation, where they'll take press releases and do them, mm -hmm. and they're not bad, but they make it very clear. If that sort of churn and detritus mm. can get dealt with elsewhere, you know, and I know it seems like a, a thing that a, a manager would say, it's like, so you can focus on the important things, mm. you know, but it does. I can mm. focus on the important things because I don't have to do the, the type of churn anymore. I can mm -hmm. just be like, here, tell me how to write a, a, a script that does this because it's not working and boom, mm. you know. Mm -hmm. Then I can just move on with my day. I can go home maybe a little early and see my kids, mm. right? you know. Mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. it's going to be used in a way that you know undermines us, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and our job. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, just full disclosure. We talk about you mm. know the Wall Street Journal. Dow Jones makes record profits, mm. and right now I'm you know we're part of we being the employers are part of a union. Mm. We are working without a contract mm. right now mm -hmm. because we are still arguing with management over cost of living increases and wages. Mm -hmm. And the role of AI is mm -hmm. a very um, mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. important conversation as part of the next contract. So. Yeah. It is, it, if, if newsrooms are not mm. talking about it and they think it's not relevant to them, they're sorely mistaken. Yeah, yeah. I, I yeah, go hopes ahead. that we can use it for great ways. Um, yeah. You know, there's the amount of digital data that's out there to try to mine for a story, the amount mm. of video out there that would be great to figure out ways mm. to prompt and find things that are now hidden would be terrific. Of course, the concern for me is that um, if you can manipulate photos and audio video, if people can't believe what they see with their eyes and mm. hear with their ears, that will make our jobs even harder mm. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. to, to make them actually believe something we did find in there. Maybe one more question would be, you know, I think about, um, you know, I, I study kind of American history and the role of religion and politics in, in the American past. It's certainly become, I think, um, news organizations have realized that Religion is really important for public life in the U.S. And I wonder, I mean, I think um, it's become more and more, it seems to me, uh, an emphasis in news organizations finding folks who can really, you know, shed light on what's happening. And I wonder, you know, as you look out at the, the landscape of the news media and, and you see the kind of coverage of faith in the media, um, is there anything you, you wish that news organizations were doing more of? Is there anything that you feel like, like stories that aren't getting told there? I know this isn't really any of you know, your beats in, in particular, but um, I just wonder as, you know, as people of faith who are in the media, do you, is there anything you wish for uh, in terms of news coverage of the media? Excuse me, of religion. I think we cover uh, religion mostly when religion gets in trouble. Mm. You know, when mm -hmm. priests are accused of uh, abuse mm -hmm. or when there's a mm -hmm. uh, evangelical leader who turns out to be spinning prophets. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I think we probably should, I mean, what I think we should do a better job mm. on is covering faith as a force in communities, which I think we, in fact, don't do very well. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, there are Supreme Court cases where, you know, faith mm -hmm. is involved, we cover it then. Mm -hmm. um, but I agree. I would, I'd say, you know, in local news, maybe we do mm -hmm. a little bit more of that. Mm -hmm. Certainly, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in Oklahoma, mm -hmm. I see quite a bit of that mm -hmm. um, of going out covering local faith leaders mm. where they're impacting the community. Mm -hmm. um, so that's encouraging, but mm. I, I think we could do a whole lot more. Mm. These questions don't get any easier. Do they? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, part of it does come to a question of uh, what are the goal of believers and church leaders in our country? Mm. And, um, you know, Obviously, there's very loud debates about 
handful of issues, mm. abortion and things, but you, there is a missing voice in a way, the church's voice in so many other public issues and social and cultural issues. And it's hard to, you know, you can understand why at times those positions might be at odds with, you know, certain, you know, half the congregation or not half the congregation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, how do, how does the church and is it the church's role to make more of a public stance on particular issues? Um, that's a good question. Mm. Um, you know, there is this other issue that is really more and more, I think, and you're going to see more in coming years is the Christian nationalism mm -hmm, uh, issue. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, this isn't the debate of yesterday about prayer in school or do we call Christmas Christmas. I mean, mm. this is whether or not things are being done, uh, whether you use Christianity as a, as, a, as a way to promote things that are non-democratic, right, mm. um, and actions that would be authoritarian. And mm. that's really getting into a very touchy mm. area, and I think it's just important to pay really close attention to mm. um, who's advocating. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I just say real quick, uh, you, you know, this kind of just as an aside, it reminds me of, you know, a lot of people are like, well, why don't we talk, write more, more, you know, more positive stories? <laughs> and and I, I, come, I come with a probably pretty unsatisfying answer to that, and that is um, for the same reason that we don't write a story saying 5,000 planes took off safely today, <laughs> we expect them to do that, mm. right? We expect mm -hmm. church to operate and not have the pastor skimming money. Right? Mm. And news, is, I mean, it's new. Like, what is what is different about this? And if we have a baseline, and mm. somebody deviates from that, and you know, it, you know, there's you know abuse in the church or what have you, and we're exposing it, and it's new. Mm. That's the way we write about it. That being said, you know, kind of Aaron's point. The one thing that we've talked about a bit at the journal is, you know, so you know, the, what the American electorate looks mm -hmm. like, the changing demographics of this mm -hmm. country, and not mm -hmm. just in terms of race and uh, ethnicity, but in terms of, of religion and values, and mm. we, I think we've seen, you know, especially in these early caucus states, um, and just the general nature of, of where this country is, there's a lot of overlap that we didn't really see mm. before. Mm -hmm. You know, things are not in these sort of nice little lines like a red state. Well, there's a lot of things that happened in that red state, and all this, you know, we, we, we assume something, and next mm. thing you know, they enshrine abortion in the Constitution, mm. or the right to abortion. Like, Things are changing, and I think mm -hmm. our ability to be able to explain that change to readers in very sort of a clear, dispassionate voice mm. is important. And you know, our new editor, um, Emma Tucker, she's been the editor in chief now of the journal for about a year, is very, very big on wanting to have humans in stories and tell them. And for people mm. who've read the Wall Street Journal, it almost was like, you know, both sides fair to a fault, and like took like the life out of journalism. Mm. You know, mm. when you'll probably notice now there's a lot more, you know, it's people-centric, like stories have people and like the tales mm. of who they are and what these communities are about. Mm. So, you know, if you haven't already, you should subscribe to the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> 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 um, so uh, there is a desire to tell that, to mm. talk about that change, you know, mm. certainly in the context of this election because mm. that's an important question, mm. but also beyond, I think, is mm -hmm. kind of important too. Mm -hmm. We're about out of time. Any closing thoughts from any of you? I mean, I really appreciate everything you've already shared. I don't know if you have a, any closing w words of wisdom for us as we go out. I have, I have no words of wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> have faith in the media. Oh, there you go. Okay, okay, okay. Um, I'll just say that uh, I don't think any reporter, certainly not the four of us, and mm. nobody I've really ever met, uh, enjoys going out and covering the murder and the mayhem and the, mm. and the you know, the, the way the institution, mm. you know, messed up or the, you know, this person in a position of power abused that. I think we all go out and do it because um, oh, we, do it. we hope for okay. change. That's great. That's great. Uh, and I think if there is a, if there's a bent, if there's a bias, if they're in the media, it is to make things better and mm. hope that through writing about it, sharing about it, having people understand it, that we can change. Um, you know, the, the Pulitzer Prize, considered the highest in the, in the, in the business, isn't always the, the award given to mm. the, uh, the, the most eloquent article written that year, mm. or, you know, somebody who discovers a theory of relativity. It's mm. about what actually changed, the, or a story that changed something. Mm. It is that story about, you know, mm. people being uh, 
exposed to chemicals in a plant or mm. people he knows that this thing that was killing kids. Mm. And you know, those are often the ones that win mm. the Pulitzer Prize mm. because they want to change things for the better. Mm. And that really is the ultimate goal for all mm. of us, I think. What Aaron said. <laughs> So we have, we have been gifted 15 extra minutes. So I think what we're going to do, if it's all right, is uh, I'm going to invite. I don't know. I don't know. But we, but we, we, we have it. And so we're going to, um, I'd love to get a, f a couple. We don't, you know, we don't have a ton of time, but maybe a couple audience questions. I know we're being filmed. Um, and so I think uh, probably someone needs a mic. Should I? OK, sure. Yeah, yeah let's come here first. Sure. Let me repeat this just so folks on live stream can hear. So the question is about the role of op-eds, uh, and and you know there's uh, such we've heard such care in in reporting practices and whatnot. Um, and sometimes uh, this question is, uh, do op-eds not reflect that same level of care? My sense is there's a there's a strong line of division within these news organizations between news and opinion. But I, I'd love to hear what you think. Maybe we don't do a good enough job of labeling them, or maybe we need to do like the news literacy project that you were doing more to explain kind of the different kinds of, of, uh, of journalism. There is, I mean, sort of like advocacy. There are shows on television and cable TV that are, have a st strong point of view, and then there are some that try to do what mainstream journalists try to do, which is to explain what's going on, and, and it's important to mm. keep them separate because if you mesh them all together, then you undermine the faith in, in what it is we are trying to do. It seems especially hard in this age where people are encountering news, not often not in a printed newspaper, where there's a s sort of dedicated section for opinion, but they're just finding snippets of articles online, or they're you know finding an article, you know, and and not sure where is this fitting in the news organization's coverage. Um. Oh yeah, uh, we have all these kind of metrics now. We can see who's reading our stories mm. and how they're reading them, and where the readers are coming from. And, you know, if you go to the front page of the Washington website, there's the news, and then there's a line, and then there's commentary, and it's all the way down the side of the page. Um, but, but in a single day anymore, I'll see on a story that 80% are coming in from social media, mm -hmm. reading it, you know, mm -hmm. through a link that they saw that mm -hmm. they got from, you know, Facebook or mm -hmm. TikTok or somewhere else. Um, and so they're not seeing where that fits into the mm -hmm. whole scheme of things. They're not seeing, is this a front page article, is this a commentary on page, mm -hmm. you know, C37. So that's difficult, and that doesn't help anything. Mm. Also, there's just an um, economic issue here, mm. which is the reason those commentaries are so high in places is because they are the thing that people will subscribe for. Mm. They want to hear the people's opinions. They want to, you mm. know, we write in a very careful way. Mm. People want to be outraged about mm. things. Mm. And they want to <laughs> the first news outraged about those things. And, and so you know, that is what drives mm. some of our business economically. There's always been a so uh, again, I work for the Wall Street Journal, and mm. the um, uh, op-ed page is very different um, mm. than uh, maybe a lot of other op-ed pages. Mm -hmm. I think it's good. It's good. There should be there mm -hmm. should be a variety of opinions. I don't think that wall could be thicker if we tried. Mm. Um, it's it's just not, and it's always awesome. Not at the journal, but when, from my experience, when mm. 
the editorial page criticizes the reporting that you've done. Mm -hmm. That's always mm -hmm. fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Which is great. It's the same, <laughs> the same company. Um, <laughs> which, is, which is funny because, I mean, at least at the journal, I mean, like, the, 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 the um, org chart, I mean, is very, I mean, like, it's like mm. several layers above before it gets to like the same person. Mm -hmm. I think it's the publisher. Mm -hmm. Like we just we just happen to share the same website and mm -hmm. print product. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. so but I mean we do need to label it better. I think we've done we being the press have done a lot better job of being like opinion, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and like what an editorial is mm -hmm. and that that you know have you. Mm -hmm. But it is it's a uh, mm. it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. More questions? Yes, sir. <laughs> that, that sort of is in the middle. Mm. It, 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 you can decide you spend either right or left. But to, to the first thing you said, that it may bleed over in terms of the perception of the news product. It does not bleed over in terms I of the it. actual news product. Yeah, there has see. never been a time uh, in my long career working at a couple places where I've ever been urged to do anything or not do something because of the editorial side or because of the advertising side. Never, mm. not once. Um, but it, but I take your point that it may affect people's perception of what uh, the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah I, I couldn't agree more with Susan. I mean, it's it, to me it's interesting. I mean, I you know I appreciate the perception. I mean, in many ways, I think an editorial page, you know, in, in any newspaper can be an albatross in that mm. regard because it it's sort of an unfair. You know, it makes it look like we're doing something we're not. You know. And, and I, this sort of extends, I think, to questions I've had, like, you know, working for Rupert Murdoch or, mm -hmm. you know, working when I was at the Post, you know, technically worked for Jeff Bezos and then the nonprofits. To me, like, that, the, there's no, like, influence like that when you're like, you know, Jeff Bezos, oh, you can't cover Amazon. Like, that, mm -hmm. that, that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. To me, I feel like there's different criticisms that I wish were raised more. To me, they're more just in, in, in terms of a, I mentioned this earlier, like, just pure like how companies run mm. and how th you know they value maybe say profits over certain things, mm -hmm. you know how they value certain stories. You know maybe they're too pro conflict. Mm -hmm. Like to me, I feel like there's there's legitimate criticism. Like there's actual criticism of things that I think have nothing to do with an mm. editorial mm -hmm. slant that I wish we would talk about more. But um, mm. yeah, I mean, and certainly it comes the other way. I get plenty of readers who be like, you know, you know, why are you? A liberal writing this story, you should be more like the op-ed page. I'm like, well, I'm not the op-ed page, so. Mm. But, you know, we have something for everybody, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> like, it, it is, there is a firewall. We work on one side, they work on another. I never talk to them, I never hear about it. I'm surprised by the stuff they write about. Um, when I worked at the Mercury News in California, they had a very aggressive editorial page, and they were trying to break news on my beat, and I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> they were going to interview council members, and Quoting, I'm like, this is my job. You stay on your side of the line. Mm. I'm on my side of the line. Um, you know, I, as a younger reporter, I felt like, yeah, if we just got rid of editorials, like mm. it would be better. You know, just mm. news and there'd be nothing else, no opinions. And then, you know, as I've gotten older, I, I just, you know, mm. also felt that for growing up in college, reading about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, if they just built a big wall between those two and left each other alone, they'd be fine. And then I went there and covered it. I'm like, that's not how the place works. Mm. You know, it's, it, you know, there are there are rules for editorials. They're ugly. Mm. Uh, you know, we write about news. I'm an investigator, so I very rarely write a news article anymore. Mm. But people write about something for days and weeks, and people barely mm. pay attention. But when an editorial board weighs in and says, look at this issue that mm. there's been 20 articles about, pay attention to that issue. It does have a role of fo focusing mm. um, attention one way or another. 
I think there's probably a role, a good role for all of them. But you're right, it does uh, affect our ability and how we're perceived. Mm. And it really has always been frustrating for probably everybody up here because we really don't have any mm. input and never will as long as we stay on our side. Mm. Time for maybe, oh, yeah, go please, yeah. Jump in here. Yeah, right. yeah please. Um, you know, it, over the history of broadcast news, there certainly has been, uh, there have been anchors who have given commentaries. You know, it's not completely uh, mm. unheard of. In fact, my local station did an experiment for probably about 10 years where they had our, our main anchor do a kind of a weekly, it was a nightly sort of his two cents. Um, and I think it was, you know, management's way of trying to mm -hmm. show that we share the values of our of our viewers. In the end, I think they decided to do away with it because it was too hard. I mean, they tried to separate it from the news product in the half hour newscast, but mm -hmm. um, I think it was a combination of them feeling like that was impossible to do, mm -hmm. and maybe they got uncomfortable with some of the things that uh, mm -hmm. he was saying. But in the end, they they, they mm -hmm. gave up on that. And the other issue. We're locally owned, and so as mm. much as I think that's benefited us in some ways, there's always the potential that when you have local ownership, they may, you know, quash a story that you want to do if that's going to impact one of their friends. But mm. I, I can I can say that that's never happened in the nearly 30 years I've been at the, my particular station. So they wow. have taken it very seriously. They they stay in their lane, and we let us do mm. our job. Time for one quick question in the far back. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a, another way to amplify your story, to extend your reach. Uh, it's a way to have a conversation with people that you might not, you know, it's, it can be hard for somebody to write you a letter mm -hmm. or even to find your email address to send it. It's easy for them to send a comment um, on social media, which mm -hmm. I think is, well, it's got some downsides, but overall I think it is a positive thing and also an inevitable one, so let's not mm -hmm. bemoan it. Let's figure mm -hmm. out how to use it in a way mm -hmm. that makes sense. It can be a really useful reporting tool too. I mean, like that. I, I mean, especially. I mean, I was covering the the, the Dolly, the ship that crashed in mm -hmm. the Key Bridge mm -hmm. in Baltimore, and you know, it was helpful to have people, mm -hmm. you know, say, "Oh, I, you know, I saw this at this time. Here's a video mm -hmm. that was taken by somebody, you know, just uploaded." It's a very it, or to find people who might have been there at the time because the, mm -hmm. you know you, you can um, what's what's called you know geolocating where somebody uploaded something. So you can be mm -hmm. like, "Okay, give me all the." Tweets or posts, X's, whatever they're called now, yeah. um, you know, of people who are in this li literal area near the bridge. Can mm. we find anything that's useful? We call mm. that open source um, mm. in intelligence, OSINT, as it's called. Mm. Um, so it's not just communicating with readers, it's helpful, but, you know, Susan's point, that's not going away. I think we look at it for what it is. You know, um, I just, you know, my recommendation, I just wish I could, if I could tell the public writ large, is, you know, content, content, which I have a problem with that word in describing journalism is, you know, uploading a picture mm. is not the same as maybe like a long curated story that takes us months to do. So I think if we just appreciate what mm. each is and what each produces, I think we're in better shape. Okay. Mm. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Good audience, too. I, I, I thank you for the integrity with which you do your work. And thank you so much for giving us a little window into that work and, and the ways you think about it um, and, and sharing so openly with us all today. Appreciate it. Hope the conversation will continue. Thank you so much. Thank you, Heath, and all of you so much. Um, and thank you all for being here. I want to highlight a couple of upcoming things that are going to keep this theme going. Um, on May 5th, Tucker Eskew, who is a deputy assistant to President George W. Bush, is going to be here talking about the movement to depolarize our lives and our families. So come back for that one. And then on May 19th, David Roll, who some of you know, um, is going to be talking to us about his new book on FDR and Truman. So um, keep some of these conversations about our public life um, going. So come back for those. Um, thank our pan. Oh, it's the 12th. Come back on the 12th. Sorry about that, David. Um, 
And when the apocalypse comes, they'll be covering it in their respective pieces. So um, again, thank you all so much for being here and thank you, Heath.